I'd like to get started. Um, this is the last colloquium of the year, of the mm -hmm. academic year anyway, and um, fittingly and um, in a way it's a kind of opportunity to, to come home, at least for today's speaker who is, is an alum. Um, and before I introduce him, of course, we um, begin with our land acknowledgement. At Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Goyacono, the Cayuga Nation. The Goyacono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, the state of New York, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Goyacono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Goyacono people past and present to these lands and waters. Vincent Reyna, a 2002 graduate of the URS program in CRP, is an associate professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning at the University of Pennsylvania. His research focuses on urban economics, low-income housing policy, household mobility, neighborhood change, and community and economic development. In 2017, he helped the city of Philadelphia develop its framework and strategy for preserving its stock of existing subsidized housing and in 2018, worked with the city of Philadelphia to write its first citywide housing plan. He was given the award for best dissertation in public policy and management by the Association of Public Policy and Management and was recently selected by the same group for the 40 for 40 fellowship. Reina is a 2018 visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, a 2018 Lincoln Institute for Land Policy Scholar, previously a fellow at the Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy at New York University, a research associate at the Lusk Center for Real Estate at the University of Southern California, a Coro Fellow, and worked at the Local Initiative Support Corporation and the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. He holds a PhD in public policy and management from USC, an MBA with a concentration in economics and real estate finance from NYU's Stern School of Business, and a Master of Science in Comparative Social Policy from the University of Oxford in England, and a BS with honors in urban studies from Cornell University. It's a great pleasure to welcome back Vincent Reyna. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jeffrey, for that very uh, uh, generous introduction. Uh, and, and thank you all so much for having me here today. Uh, I know these are very tough times. Many of you were in the conversation that we were just having before we started with ongoing police violence um, and, and, and so many other things going on that uh, I know we are all uh, exhausted on, on many fronts. Um, and, and so I wanna acknowledge and, and thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. And by virtue of, of, uh, uh, of, of caring about this topic, you know, or being here, you're showing a clear care for this topic as well, which in my mind, you know, it's clear that eviction also uh, uh, serves as a, often a form of violence that disproportionately uh, affects black households. And so what I'm gonna be doing today is presenting some work uh, uh, that I've done with, I'm gonna actually share my screen first, sorry. Uh, so that way I can do that. All right, there we go. Um, and I think I can still put it in full screen mode. Uh, view, full screen mode, cool. All right. Uh, have you all? Is that, is that working for you? Yes, cool, awesome. Um, so, uh, so I'm gonna be presenting a paper today, Shelter from Eviction, a Framework for Understanding the Relationship Between Subsidized Housing Programs and Eviction. Uh, this work is with Greg Preston. He actually just started his PhD program, the PhD program at UCLA. Uh, his advisors, Mike Lenz, Pavo, uh, Mike Manville, great group there, amongst many others. Uh, he is a graduate of our MCP program, uh, and this is a project actually that started from 
his work through uh, working with the city through AmeriCorps VISTA, I believe, uh, where he's working with the city on their eviction task force. And so um, we started brainstorming various research ideas and then he came to our program and we started working together. And this is the first of what, what we hope were several papers on this topic. Uh, this paper is coming out next week in housing policy debate or so they say next week. Um, and so uh, excited to share this work. Uh, Greg is amazing and I hope you all get a chance to interact with him as well. Um, so before I go into the paper, I just wanted to kind of share a little bit about my research agenda broadly. My research covers a lot of different areas, and I hope you see this as an opportunity to engage with each other uh, on an ongoing basis. I, I know there's a lot I can learn from you all as well. There's amazing stuff going on in your department, but individually you all have experiences uh, and, and research interests that likely connect with some aspect of my work. And uh, as a not just a former, uh, you know, undergrad at Cornell, but just generally someone interested in this field and acknowledging that many of you in this room are at the forefront of the thinking uh, of the research in these spaces. Uh, I'd be excited to, to further engage with you in conversations on these topics. Um, so I work on issues of housing affordability, estimating needs and looking at the implications, uh, looked at issues of eviction and housing stability. I focus a lot on the role of subsidized housing uh, and its impact on neighborhoods and households, and particularly the idea that uh, owners can leave subsidized housing programs. And what does that mean for our production of subsidized housing, but also for the people who live in these properties and the neighborhoods where they're developed? Uh, my some of my recent work has focused on energy cost burdens and energy consumption and looking at notions of energy efficiency and particularly tying that to new issues of data science and opportunities around that, but also around issues of housing affordability and the intrinsic connection of those two things. Yesterday, I had the honor of uh, hosting a Climate Center event with Dr. Tony Reams at Michigan, who's also doing amazing work in that space, uh, and in my eyes is, is the leader in that space right now, or, or, or one of the many leaders, but clearly doing awesome work. And so I encourage you to check out his work in that space as well. I've done a lot of work around vouchers, uh, particularly looking at the role of vouchers as safety nets, who can access them, who can't. Uh, I have an ongoing study on the voucher lottery in Los Angeles, uh, which is actually a mixed method study where we're looking at both data of everyone who applied, who made it on the wait list and who's making it through the voucher process. And we've been interviewing households who are actually on the voucher wait list. Uh, have done a bunch of work around fair housing, recently published a co-edited book, a book that I co-edited called Perspectives on Fair Housing. And we actually had a series of talks that are on the Penn IUR website uh, with some really wonderful speakers looking at the connection of fair housing and housing and a broad set of outcomes. And I encourage you to check out those videos if you have the opportunity. Uh, and hopefully you can check out our book and find that interesting as well. I'm working on a project right now around spatial mismatch and location affordability. We have an NSF planning grant where we're working with three state housing finance agencies, uh, local uh, municipal planning organizations, and regional transportation organizations. This is in conjunction with Professor Ryerson, who's a transportation planner in our department, and looking at, you know, can we create new and novel ways to really leverage uh, the housing production system to more actively address issues of spatial mismatch. Uh, and finally, my, my work in more, more recent times has really taken a focus a lot on COVID-19, its impacts and responses. Uh, and I'm just gonna highlight a, a little of that, that, that right now. Um, this work has been formalized in this new initiative that I'm calling the Housing Initiative at a Pen. We're not actually a research center, we're just an initiative. Uh, I've been working with some colleagues on a series of projects uh, and we realized that once you work on enough projects, you should actually give yourself a name so you're a thing. So this is our thing, right? Um, I would say uh, we've been had the honor to be involved in a lot of really uh, interesting work. As said in the intro, I helped the city of Philadelphia write its 10-year housing plan, which they've adopted, implemented, and they're actually uh, developing an unprecedented level of programs. Uh, they actually didn't have a citywide housing agency before, and that was a product of our housing plan. Uh, and with the increased amount of federal funding coming through, now there's a lot more opportunities there. We helped the city of Cincinnati develop a housing strategy. Um, that city actually did not adopt that housing strategy, uh, uh, but the many local stakeholders are actually working and moving forward with it. And I'm currently working with Professor Akira Drake Rodriguez in my department amongst others on developing the city of Cleveland's 10 year housing plan. Uh, I think we're gonna retire our housing plan work for a little while after these experiences, we've definitely learned a lot. 
uh, from that. But more broadly, we've been working a lot on also a lot of COVID rent relief efforts. So with my colleagues here, Claudia Aiken and Sydney Goldstein, we've been helping municipalities across the country uh, develop, uh, implement, and evaluate their rent relief programs. I would say these rent relief partnerships are not a fee-for-service relationship. This is actually what I see as a real nice opportunity of showing the opportunities and strengths of uh, leveraging the resources of a university and partnering with municipalities to think more broadly about the development and provision of public programs. Uh, and so when a lot of these municipalities were developing their programs, uh, I think I have a slide here of many of the places we're working with. Initially, we started working with these places and what we realized is that you know, they were given unprecedented amount of resources to develop uh, an unprecedented problem that in many ways were rooted in longstanding problems of housing instability, housing insecurity, uh, that many cities did not have the resources to address. Uh, during this time, all of these cities started getting funds to develop rent relief programs to actually start addressing issues of housing instability being exacerbated by COVID-19. Uh, but that's in the context of long-term disinvestment where many of these places didn't have these programs. They didn't have a framework for developing them, for deploying them, or the capacity to do either. No less to think about how to actually evaluate and learn from them. Uh, and so we've been fortunate to work with these municipalities to essentially embed an evaluation in their rent relief programs. Um, so John, do you wanna chime in? Are you showing slides? We're only looking at, we only see the first page. Yeah, well, oh. I was gonna add that just a second. Oh, ago. yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm on like slide number uh, slide number 10. Um, and so no, let we, me... we've only got the title. <laughs> All right. Well, in that case, uh, that's that's uh, that's unfortunate. Um, can you see different slides now? No. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so what, I'll, now. what I will do, I, I apologize for that. Um, thank you for bringing that up. I'm just going to leave it in this mode so that way I can do this. Can you see? Yeah. Slides? Awesome. Um, so what we've done is we partnered with a bunch of cities to essentially embed an evaluation in their rent relief programs where someone, people who apply actually consent to being in our study. Uh, we survey them through a baseline survey that we compensate them through with gift cards. Uh, and we've been doing follow-up surveys with these uh, residents who applied, some of whom receive rent relief, many of whom sadly do not. We've also been surveying landlords because a lot of these programs are structured to have the subsidy flow through the landlord themselves. Uh, and more broadly, we've been partnering with the Furman Center for Real Estate Urban Policy and the National Income Housing Coalition to do national evaluations of all the rent relief programs across the country. We did a detailed survey of 220 rent relief programs across the country, uh, where we asked essentially a whole host of questions in a half hour long survey. Uh, and through these 220 responses, we're able to do an in-depth analysis of who's doing what, who's getting dollars out the door, who they're serving, what seems to be working, what's not working. We then use that survey data to then subset to a group of 15 case studies based on a series of criteria to then dive into what these places are doing, why and how to better understand those realities. And then one of the things we did beyond the analysis of what people are doing, how and why and what seems to be working is we really wanted to lift up the importance of, of advancing racial equity through these programs and for it to be an intentional effort and to acknowledge what places are doing, uh, what seems to be working and how municipalities could think really proactively and creatively in advancing racial equity and designing that in the actual emergency rental assistance programs. I think there's a lot we can learn here and there's a lot we're gonna keep learning. Uh, you know, we have a lot of households involved in our tenant surveys, a lot of owners involved in our landlord surveys, uh, and a lot of municipalities now involved in our municipal surveys that are on an ongoing basis and have relieved a whole series of reports beyond the three highlighted here. Uh, most recently, we released, released a report based on a survey of, of over 25,000 households in Los Angeles, uh, ex documenting their experiences right now during COVID across a broad set of perspectives. Uh, we're about to release a report based on Baltimore and Atlanta, showing over two waves of surveys, how uh, the challenges have changed over time for many households, uh, only gotten worse and the role that rent relief has played in alleviating some of those uh, of some of those challenges, but clearly has been uh, insufficient for the level of need that we're seeing right now. Um, so that's all to say, to introduce my work there, to say that I would love to naturally talk with each of you about all of those topics more broadly, but today I'm gonna to be focusing on the paper uh, on eviction uh, and subsidized housing. So this paper was really motivated by trying to really think about uh, a way we can add value to a lot of the uh, amazing eviction related research going on and efforts in the space. Um, you know, we know that eviction and unmet needs of affordable housing are intimately and structurally linked, right? Uh, 
Uh, eviction policy is largely in the realm of legal reforms uh, and doesn't always focus on, focus on preventative future evictions. Uh, this idea of investing in people, investing in place to avoid evictions even happening rather than going into the process of eviction and trying to protect people once we've started there, right? Clearly the latter is essential, but we also need the former. And we need to think of more and more tools to do the former. In many ways, housing policy has been constrained by a scarcity mindset for too long, right? There's been a lack of resources. So in many ways, we often think of defense uh, and we have to increasingly think of investment, right? Uh, and what we wanted to explore is how can we think of place-based subsidized housing as one of those investments that is an important part of our toolkit for looking at the relationship between housing affordability and, and eviction. Uh, one primary means of increasing affordable housing is the administration of place-based subsidized housing programs. That we actually know very little about the scale and nature of eviction filing practices within subsidized properties. One of the statistics often thrown out in Philadelphia is that the largest evictor in the city of Philadelphia is the Public Housing Authority. They also happen to be by far the largest known property owner, right? The Public Housing Authority not only owns the most units, but they actually register that they own the most units. As many of you likely know, sadly, we know very little about who owns most properties in most cities. Renter registration databases are often thin, and even within those, what owners do is often set up separate shell corporations uh, that essentially don't allow us to see the connections between companies that might actually own multiple properties within one space. So what this does is it presents a troubling reality, which it can be true that unfortunately there are high levels of eviction in subsidized housing uh, and particularly in public housing, but those actually could still be far fewer than similar market rate properties. And so just telling that first part essentially casts public housing in a negative light without the counterfactual, right? And so what we wanted to do is really unpack and explore this dynamic and really create more of a critical framework for thinking about the role of place-based subsidized housing uh, in, in protecting households. I would say the last bit of motivation here I wanna hit on as well is, you know, Section 8 vouchers are an incre a, a incredibly important part of our toolkit. But one of the things we often do is we overestimate, I think, the benefit of Section 8 vouchers, right? Because uh, we don't acknowledge all the transaction costs that low-income households face and the barriers they face uh, when trying to access housing stability and don't often look at the connection even between vouchers and housing stability, particularly in the context of eviction, right? So one of the goals here was to really also focus in on place-based housing to make the case for why would we maybe even want to pay more for a place-based investment, right? Uh, are there other benefits that accrue by virtue of doing that? One of it could be that you actually protect households further from housing instability and that housing instability presents larger social costs that are important to realize upfront and capitalize that might cause you to pay twice as much to develop a place-based subsidized housing unit, but actually accrue through benefits uh, that, that accrue through households and their welfare over time. Um, I would say at any point, please feel free to interject. I'm not really gonna do a very good job of mining the chat um, because uh, uh, as you can see already, because you put in the chat and I didn't even notice that I wasn't advancing slides, right? Um, so uh, I, I was told in class often that my ability to do both at once doesn't flow very well. Uh, and so I will, uh, I will just be mining the presentation, but feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. Um, so the key questions here is how might we expect the structure and administration of property-based housing subsidy programs to influence the incidence of eviction? What is the scale and nature of eviction filings in subsidized properties? And to what extent does residing in subsidized properties influence the probability a tenant faces an eviction filing or eviction itself, right? And so here, what we're doing is trying to, if nothing else, even paint this descriptive landscape, mapping these two things onto each other is something that's actually not been done, right? Uh, there are some studies that are trying to do that now. Uh, they're often city specific, as is ours. Ours focuses on Philadelphia. But the idea of even just layering on eviction filings to all properties and all subsidized properties, painting that descriptive picture on its own is something that we still actually know very little about. And then more robustly kind of testing that through statistical methods to look at uh, whether instances of eviction are lower in subsidized properties versus unsubsidized ones is something that very much has not been done up to this point. 
So um, what we are doing in this paper first, before we do all of that, is we actually wanted to develop a framework to understand the ways in which subsidized housing might influence the instances and implications of eviction, right? We should not be so naive to think that uh, government programs are going to be perfect, right? I don't think anyone in this room thinks that, uh, or that subsidized housing is a panacea, right? And is flawless. Uh, and is seamlessly going to help everyone uh, be protected from evictions, right? I think we often look at policy solutions and look at one when we know the problems are more complex and the solutions need to be more complex. So what we wanted to do is really first develop a framework for thinking about what, what ways could place-based subsidized housing actually protect households, right? What ways could they not, right? And how might that actually play out? And we're hoping that framework actually helps what we're doing here in Philadelphia be tested across other cities as well. So naturally from there, we wanna test this theoretical effects on a relatively large sample of data. Um, we wanna explore some of the local nuance and findings and discuss practical implications and propose policy implications, right? Uh, again, you know, our study is Philadelphia specific. I think the framework clearly applies more broadly to subsidized housing. Uh, our findings probably also apply to other settings as well, but we also need to acknowledge that in many ways, you know, the findings here could also be a case study that don't necessarily translate perfectly to other settings where the market's different, realities are different. And so that's why it's important when we're doing city specific studies to kind of be sensitive to the generalizability to a national level, right? Um, and so we know a little bit about evictions and subsidized housing. Um, uh, it's uh, a, a new topic where there are two papers in this last year, uh, one of which is gonna be published in the same special issue that we're coming out with. Uh, it's gonna be in in housing policy debate. So our, our, our two studies are, are happening in tandem. But the first actually looks at as a probabilistic survey of children born in large cities um, uh, using a national representative data set of, of families with kids uh, and that has a flag for whether someone lives in subsidized housing. Uh, and they test whether receiving housing assistance at the age of nine was associated with a decrease in the probability of experience eviction from age nine to five. Uh, they find that living in public housing decreased the probability of evic eviction with respect to no assistance, um, uh, but they found uh, no effect for the housing choice voucher uh, program. Uh, in a forthcoming paper by uh, Harrison, who's a, who's a doctoral student uh, under Dan Immergluck right now uh, uh, at Georgia State. Um, and Ernst, Ernst uh, you know, the problem of, of the first time saying someone's name out loud when you've said it in your head 20 times is uh, you, you haven't practiced it. So sorry. So Ernst Zanelson, um, uh, I apologize as if I say that, said that incorrectly. And Earl, uh, they use a sample of multifamily properties in Metro Atlanta. Uh, they test whether subsidized properties are associated with lower property level eviction rates after controlling for neighborhood and property characteristics. Uh, they find that subsidized housing has a negative yet statistically insignificant association with eviction filings. So their coefficient is negative, but it's not significant in their study, right? Uh, they find that senior properties are associated with negative and significant effects though. So for their, in their study, they only find that essentially senior subsidized housing uh, protects households from evictions, but that subsidized housing writ large, they find a negative effect, but it's not significant. So, so a lot more to be tested. Uh, I think a lot of that, and they, they, they suspect as well as a product of the fact that they have a smaller sample size that they're working with. And so it's hard to get statistical power uh, when naturally when you have a smaller sample size. So coming back to our framework. So first we're developing a framework for the effects of subsidized housing uh, on evictions. Uh, we're looking at drivers and correlates of evictions. Uh, and then we're looking at the, essentially the attributes of subsidized housing itself. So these are gonna be several unpretty slides uh, in the time constraint known as COVID. Uh, I, I did not have the time to make these slides as pretty. So I just kind of took them from the paper and pasted them here. So I apologize for that. I also apologize for the excessive amount of words uh, on these slides. Uh, but what I wanna do is kind of talk through what we know from the research thus far of some of the traditional drivers of eviction. Uh, and, and how that might actually play out through subsidized housing. What we do in this is uh, we also actually do a detailed nuance of like by program, which is a unique contribution of this as well. And so we often treat subsidized housing as one monolithic thing, but every program is actually different. They often serve different populations and they very much have different programmatic structures. So public housing is publicly owned and managed. Project-based section eight is actually privately owned and deals with renewable contracts that private owners actually renew over time. The low-income housing tax credit program is also privately owned. 
their, 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 their units are meant to be affordable, but the affordability is actually not tied to an individual's income. It's tied to area median income levels. And so what that means is that there's no adjustment mechanisms based on someone's income for how much they're gonna pay in rent. So I essentially come into what is supposed to be an affordably priced unit. But if I'm a low income individual and uh, my income goes down, my rent doesn't adjust accordingly. So I actually could be rent burden going into the property because that affordable rent can actually still be above 30% of the area median income uh, based on my income. Uh, or, and then I could be even more housing cost burden because if I receive an income shock, my rent levels aren't adjusting in the way that they would adjust in public housing where your rent payment is actually tied to your income itself, right? So there's a lot of nuance of these programs that can lead to different effects of the way someone interacts with housing affordability, but also particularly with eviction. Uh, and so I acknowledge in saying this again, that I'm kind of throwing a lot out here. Uh, and I'm also speaking maybe a little too fast because I'm trying to also throw a lot out here. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, and also again, would love to have this be an ongoing conversation. So clearly one driver of eviction, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, getting the, I'm getting the hand signals to slow down. Uh, luckily, not, John knew not to put that in the chat because I would not have seen that, but I could acknowledge his hand signals. Uh, and so um, uh, one clear driver of eviction is discrimination, right? Uh, and these are individual acts of discrimination and these are structural discrimination, right? There's a lot of, uh, of, of, of documentation of the way that discrimination has directly amplified uh, eviction rates for black households in particularly, uh, black female households particularly, uh, but households of color in general, right? Um, and so what's interesting in subsidized housing programs is that you do have in enhanced legal protections and greater accountability structures by virtue of them being known owners who are monitored, who often go through inspections and who are regulated, right? both uh, logistically through HUD, but often publicly through public accountability measures, right? Uh, because everything they do is required to be a lot more well-known, not perfectly well-known. I'm not so naive to think that there's perfect accountability with public agencies and subsidized housing programs, but they're much more well-known than a similar market rate property, right? And so what this does is this uh, essentially outlines processes around eviction uh, and, and greater accountability that would expose uh, individual acts of discrimination on behalf of the owners of these properties uh, more actively, not perfectly, but more actively than in similar market rate properties, right? Uh, there's also clearly kind of fair housing laws are actively uh, uh, you know, tied to a lot of these programs. Um, uh, there are often good cause protections that are tied to subsidized housing programs uh, at the local level, but also at the, at the federal level. Uh, so what this does is in combination, it could reduce the individual acts of discrimination experienced by households across the board in subsidized housing properties. So what this does is the plus there, it means that subsidized housing positively reduces the odds of eviction of someone's of, uh, due to an individual act of discrimination. There are also dist structural discrimination by virtue of having regulated and or income adjusted rents Subsidized housing may reduce the negative impact that structural racism in labor markets has on evictions, right? So we know that structural, uh, structural racism in labor markets affects people's wages, but also their job stability, right? And so what that means is it reduces wages and wage potential, but it also increases economic vulnerability. And that means the odds of an economic shock that would affect your ability to actually pay rent, right? So by virtue of the uh, rents in public housing and project-based section eight specifically being tied to a household income and having that adjustment mechanism where your payment level would actually go down. What it actually does is it, it acts as some protection from that structural discrimination in the labor market, which would then affect your ability to actually pay rent uh, and, and, and likely be evicted due to non-payment, right? The tax credit program of all of those is the least protective here. The rents are often below market, not always in some markets. But as I said before, there's no rent adjustment mechanism. So the, the, the protection from structural discrimination in labor markets is a little less in that program. Um, we know that subsidized households could also though be more exposed to discriminatory policing. Uh, we know there's a lot of stigma around subsidized housing through, through a lot of great research that has been done. We know that, that it's largely unwarranted, right? Uh, and despite those realities, it persists, right? 
uh, and you often see over policing by some known subsidized housing developments, uh, as well as uh, increasing uh, social controls placed on social subsidized households by their neighbors. That then also results in higher instances of, of calling police on uh, in, in instances, right? So this could actually further expose um, uh, people in subsidized housing actually to, to structural discrimination uh, uh, through our policing system, right? Because they're more likely to be exposed to policing and, and, and unfair policing along the way. Um, and so that actually serves as a negative effect because uh, what, you, what you find is that in a lot of subsidized housing programs is actually often strict provisions uh, administered at the local level. Interestingly, it's not often around incarceration and whether someone who's experienced incarceration could actually live in subsidized housing uh, and that has severe implications for their, their, relation, their, their relatives who they live with. Um, so sorry, I'm seeing a, a, a hand. Um, I can't see your name. I can just see your hand up. Sorry. I have a question. Do you want to ask your question? Just, yeah. Uh, so can, you, can you go back when you were talking about um, how subsidized housing can be exposed to more discriminative police systems? Um, mm -hmm. Could you explain, just repeat and explain a little bit more on how that's possible and uh, what caused that in like maybe slower? <laughs> yes. Oh, that's yeah. Very yeah. interesting Sorry. topic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it is. Yeah, and it's and it's actually a, a very contentious and much debated one, right? So, uh, I'm gonna in the mid 2000s there was this uh, horrendous article by the Atlantic that basically said Section 8 vouchers cause crime, um, and it was based on a flawed study, uh, uh, largely descriptive, that basically said found that uh, where voucher households live had higher crime. Right, so this is the problem of stats is that correlation is not causation. There's a lot of other mechanisms in place, not the least of which is long-term disinvestment in areas where vouchers are. And the fact that vouchers often only allow households to access those neighborhoods where uh, prices are often depreciating um, uh, or, or low, right? Uh, but beyond that, it's rooted in long-standing beliefs that subsidized housing causes crime. Low-income households and subsidized households particularly cause crime, right? Uh, you know, that's not based on science. That's based on racism and discrimination, right? Uh, and so, and sadly, it has compounded over time to the point that, I mean, even there was like a PBS documentary, uh, I think three years ago now, I forget the name of the series. There was a, a Section 8 development going up in a suburb. The suburb was protesting it, nimbyism left and right. And there was a woman who was comfortable saying on record uh, and being recorded, uh, look, I don't feel safe by subsidized housing. I know it's gonna cause a lot of crime and bring crime into our neighborhood and it's gonna decrease our property values. So the way that formalizes is that formalizes on that woman and it's not just that woman, it's that man, it's that many other people, right? Uh, who then uh, one, believe that, Two, they act accordingly and they often move out of neighborhoods that it becomes a self-fulfilled prophecy that subsidized housing brings down property values because they're acting based on fear, not based on reality and an unfounded fear at that. But beyond that, it also call, often transpires in the form of households like calling police actively more. Often cities actually buying into this reality and assigning police forces to, right ne to be right next to a subsidized housing development, right? Uh, if you've ever walked through public housing, it's not uncommon to see security guards there, right, in some way, shape, or form, or the city police there kind of routinely monitoring the area, right? Uh, often subsidized housing properties are over-policed areas uh, as a result uh, of the stigma that's tied to them. Uh, but on top of that, then, like I said before, they're often exposed to neighbors calling the police often through things like social controls, right? So I live in a neighborhood, and I, the next neighborhood over in Philadelphia, there's a public housing development, the neighborhood is gentrified around it. Uh, and what you find is that the gentrifiers uh, uh, don't necessarily agree with, they have a different set of social norms and controls that they're then applying to the public housing development. So the level, level of noise complaints and violations, uh, you know, those kind of uh, uh, techniques that are used, you call 311, you call the police, the police have to come and actually address them. Those kind of things kind of increase over time, right? And often get targeted towards subsidized housing, uh, even when some of those things actually aren't even transpiring uh, or aren't even illegal, right? Um, and so uh, that's all to say is that a long-winded way of saying is that there are a lot of reasons to believe that by virtue of living in subsidized housing, 
you might actually be more over policed uh, than someone who does not live in subsidized housing because they know that you are a low income person living in a supportable housing development and they have so many unfounded priors tied to that. Um, does that answer your question? Cool. Um, so, uh, so I forget how long I have, but I'm, I'm destined to go over. So please just also cut me off and interject along the way. Uh, you know, this is, this is, I, I'll, I'll give the, now that I have tenure, I could just talk as long as I want, right? And uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, uh, so, uh, so anyway, uh, you know, there's, there's other drivers that could affect the eviction, neighborhood change, right? So uh, as, uh, uh, you know, we know that, you know, rent appreciation could lead to people essentially being priced out, right? And so as rents are appreciating, there's increased pressure uh, through prices going up, which makes units more, less unaffordable, you know, less affordable, right? So there's a price mechanism there, but there's also the reality is that for many owners, they might want to kick out their longstanding tenant to get a, to essentially attract uh, a new tenant who has a much higher willingness to pay for the same unit or ability to pay rather is a better way of saying it, right? Um, and so what you can find clearly is that areas uh, where there's rent appreciation and prices are going up, by virtue of those prices going up, you're gonna see challenges around non-payment increase um, and higher instances of eviction due to non-payment. So insofar as place-based subsidized housing not only is required to be affordable in perpetuity, but they also have rent adjustment mechanisms where actually your rent payment is tied to your income, not towards the market value for that unit. You're actually less likely to be uh, evicted, not just for non-payment, because you are more likely to be able to pay because your rent is still adjusting based on your income. But beyond that, you're less likely to be evicted due to speculation where an owner wants to get you out because they either want to sell the property or they want to bring in someone with a higher ability to pay, right? Uh, so what happens is subsidized housing could actually uh, protect households from some neighborhood change going on, right? In a gentrifying area, right? It doesn't control for the cost of all other goods, right? Housing is one of your many goods you consume. So we need to acknowledge that your overall cost of living goes up. So while your rent is adjusting, other parts of your life could become more expensive. So you could still face increased challenges due to non-payment because the cost of all other goods went up. Uh, so even though you still have the same income, your rent is, is, is in theory affordable tied to that income, your costs have gone up, right? Uh, so there are realities there that, that could cause some challenges. Uh, another thing to keep in mind though is not all subsidized housing is required to be affordable in perpetuity. Uh, as I said, some of these units are privately owned. Uh, through my own research, I've shown that owners in, uh, in, in who, who own subsidized properties in areas where property prices are appreciated are more likely to leave those programs. Many of those owners are not reacting to the current value of their property, they're reacting to the future value of the property, which is essentially what most markets are looking to transact on, right? And so what that means is that programs where affordability restrictions are for a lesser amount of time uh, and owners can opt out at some point, you essentially uh, face some fear at some point of property owner speculation leading to eviction, right? Uh, and so that's one of the things we test for here is when owners are eligible to leave uh, subsidized housing programs, particularly when the affordability restrictions end in a low-income housing tax credit property where they're set to be affordable for a fixed period of time, do you actually see eviction levels going up? Um, so it's all to say that, you know, this is a scenario where it gets nuanced by programs, right? So you would expect in public housing, there's no property owner speculation because in theory, public, public housing is meant to be affordable in perpetuity, but you could actually see some property owner speculation risk in these privately owned subsidized housing portfolios, right? Uh, and so that's an important thing to test for. Another driver known for causing eviction is behavioral regulation. So this is uh, some of the stuff I alluded for before, which is the idea of uh, often imposing social controls uh, on households, uh, particularly low-income households, uh, and often using mechanisms like calling the police, uh, calling in code violations, things along those lines, as a way to impose uh, your desired behavior on the broader neighborhood, right? Uh, uh, and so uh, what's interesting is, uh, again, similar to the, to the crime piece, 
there's reason to believe that households in subsidized housing might actually be further exposed to social controls, right? Because again, you often know that's a subsidized housing development. Um, and so by virtue of them knowing that, it leads to that bias being actively applied to those properties. Uh, so you could see some increased risk due to social controls uh, placed on the properties in subsidized housing. Um, uh, another behavioral regulation is uh, uh, the, the, the exercise of legal right. Uh, administrative processes and accountability create formal systems to address concerns around housing quality issues. Uh, so in theory, you are allowed to call in a housing code violation on your owner, right? The problem with our current system is that then someone has to come in and actually inspect your unit, right? Uh, and so what people fear is that if I call on a violation on my unit, it's gonna essentially notify my owner that I'm complaining to them publicly about some aspect of my unit they are, that they are actively not addressing. And what that does is that might actually increase my odds of eviction. Because those are scenarios where maybe say a pre-existing condition where you owed some back rent and you came into an agreement, an informal agreement with your owner about paying those. Uh, if you call in that violation, an owner is gonna say, hey, you haven't paid your back rent, right? And you go to eviction court, and even though you had that informal agreement about paying your back rent, that's not gonna hold in court, right? And so what tenants in subsidized housing probably have or do have is some increased ability to exercise their legal rights around things like housing quality. There are set systems in place where they can actually report housing quality issues. So again, we're not so naive to think that all those housing quality issues are addressed, right? We also know that there's long-standing housing quality issues in public housing. Uh, for way too long, public housing has been funded at 85 cents on the dollar. Um, there's been a lot of deferred maintenance uh, uh, across portfolios across the country that's led to tons of capital needs that are very much showing in the public housing stock, right? Um, but it is to say that if a tenant reports that violation, they have less fear of eviction, right? Because it's a much more regulated process for both reporting that violation, but with which that violation has to actually be addressed or, or kind of explored by the entity involved in a, a subsidized housing program. In, uh, further, in, in something like the low-income housing tax credit program where it's privately owned, there you actually have investors who have a financial interest in the uh, in the in the quality of the uh, of the building itself, they often set up reserves tied to addressing housing quality issues, but their return is based on being tied to this property for a fixed period of time, uh, that is intrinsically also tied to issues of housing quality, right? And so even in that private sector model, there's more mechanisms for the owner to maybe want to actively address their current housing quality issues but also for them to want tenants to want to report those, right? Because they don't want an asset that depreciated too soon and all of a sudden they have to make capital repairs when they're just trying to ride this out to the end of their initial investment period, right? Uh, and so there are kind of increased mechanisms for tenants to potentially exercise their legal rights around things like housing quality and subsidized housing programs. So now I get to the data. So we set this framework out. Overall, it seems like subsidized housing on the whole protects a lot of people. Place-based subsidized housing could protect tenants from a lot of the drivers that we know of eviction, but not all of them. So then we focus in on Philadelphia. Um, what we've done is we've essentially looked aggregately and in a macro level uh, at eviction in Philadelphia. Uh, I'll go through how we did that in a second. Um, we focus on the years of 2006 to 2017. Uh, but here we show kind of uh, changes in eviction rates over time. Note that the drop in filings in 2002 corresponds to a change in reporting, not a structural change in actual eviction that's going on. So it's more of a kind of a change in the process around uh, of recording eviction. Uh, on the left, though, you'll see a timeline that's documenting that the city of Philadelphia has increasingly, like many other cities, been thinking about eviction uh, and developing policy around eviction. Uh, we actually have a very active eviction diversion program uh, in the city of Philadelphia. Interestingly, the city of Philadelphia is actually the only city in the country right now, as far as I know, uh, and this is based on our national analysis, but you know, there's always more you can maybe not know because uh, there's a moving reality that actually requires all tenants currently in the COVID setting to, be, to go through its rent relief program 
prior to being able to actually pursue any eviction going forward. So once the CDC eviction moratoria ends in the city of Philadelphia, you won't be able to go through the local court system and file eviction unless you already try to cure the issues through existing subsidy programs that the city is actually able to fund through existing federal resources tied to COVID. And that's actually a really interesting protection they put in place. Um, so eviction filings are large in the city of Philadelphia, right? Uh, but they're also spatially concentrated. Um, they disproportionately affect low-income households, uh, but they also disproportionately affect black households, right? Uh, this is something consistent with what's been found in a lot of the, 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 the recent literature. There were a lot of city-specific studies that have shown this, but Matt Desmond and his group at the Eviction Lab recently did a national study that, that, that just came out that, that showed this relationship as well. So what we did is we uh, were able to use detailed eviction filing uh, data that shows whether uh, you know, it was filed and whether someone was actually evicted. Uh, for every household in the city of Philadelphia, um, fortunately, there's a, a local data expert. He actually works for the city, but he does this in spare time where he's been scraping court records for years. Uh, he loves sharing these data. Uh, and what you can get is essentially every eviction filing in the city of Philadelphia with a lot of detailed information associated with it. Uh, there's a lot of cleaning that's required to be done in order to actually kind of drill down to the address level and make sure that you have the correct address. But what we did is we actually did that. We, we cleaned it, we brought it down to the parcel level. We mapped every single parcel at a micro level, right, in, in the city of Philadelphia. We layered on the eviction filing from 2009 to 2017. Uh, and then we also are able to know all of the properties that have any form of subsidy and even multiple forms of subsidy within the city of Philadelphia. And we also brought that down to the parcel level, right? So our outcome of interest is eviction filing. Our treatment of interest is identifying essentially someone actively receiving some form of federal uh, place-based housing assistance, right? To look at the impact of that on eviction filings. Uh, and we're able to control for essentially a whole host of uh, property and track level characteristics, right? So by virtue of having the parcel information, we actually have a ton of information about that property and its characteristics. We also could do block level census data. We could do track level census data. Um, and we could also layer on things like housing code violations that are reported, although we know that's an imperfect proxy, all of these kinds of things to create a robust set of controls to explore this relationship. So this isn't an experimental setting in any way, but this is a very kind of detailed, multi-layered model with a lot of different controls in it, right? And so first, we just look descriptively, you know, at market rate and subsidized housing uh, and, and looking at the key ways they might differ, uh, you know, spatially, right? In the neighborhoods that they're located in. Uh, and particularly across some of the drivers, like so things like household rent burden, uh, but even, um, you know, the share uh, black in a given neighborhood, uh, and, and all of these kinds of things to paint some kind of descriptive story about where eviction filings are happening uh, and where subsidized properties are versus similar lower cost market rate properties, right? Uh, but then what we can do beyond that is kind of test then. Uh, so we descriptively could see some discrepancies between subsidized and market rate properties uh, in, in some kind of eviction filing rates in the context of, of their borough neighborhoods, but then we can actually test for that, right? Where essentially our uh, outcome of interest is an eviction filing. We're looking at a dummy of whether the property actually has a subsidy on it. And then we also kind of decompose by program. So we have just one model that's like, is there any subsidy? And another model of essentially program specific subsidies to look at program specific events. We can have a time fixed effect. We had a time fixed effects per year. Um, we uh, look at uh, control for different neighborhood characteristics as well. Um, uh, and, and essentially use that model to, to, to explore this relationship. Um, so we have some key findings, which is that, uh, you know, we look at first naturally the eviction filing rate by property type. Uh, and what you can see generally is that descriptively uh, subsidized properties on the whole, subsidized multifamily properties. And again, we subset to multifamily properties because uh, all subsidized properties are multifamily properties. So we want to compare apples to apples here, right? Uh, so we're, we're, we're getting rid of uh, the, uh, the smaller multifamily properties, say the five or fewer unit properties in the city of Philadelphia when we're doing this comparison. Um, so here you can see when we look at subsidized versus unsubsidized multifamily properties, descriptively, 
uh, the eviction filing rates lower, right? Uh, it's not zero though, and that's an important thing to remember, right? So again, subsidized housing isn't a panacea, but it actually can be something where you see lower instances of eviction filings. Uh, then we break it out by subsidy program. And what you can see is there is some variation descriptively by subsidized housing programs, right? Um, interestingly enough, uh, public housing has the largest uh, uh, eviction filing rate by unit. Um, and uh, the, the project-based Section 8 program, uh, which is privately owned, but has the same rent adjustment mechanisms as public housing, actually has a lower eviction filing rate, right? Um, descriptively, this, this might be surprising to say, well, wow, the private owner program actually has a lower uh, 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 eviction filing rate. That said, uh, there are way more, particularly in Philadelphia, way more social controls tied to public housing in the city of Philadelphia. Um, uh, there's a lot better knowledge of what those developments are. Some project-based Section 8 developments actually blend in a little more actively to uh, the, 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 the fabric around them, whereas a lot of uh, public housing developments are either still small towers or, or clearly redeveloped uh, small towers into lower density units that everyone kind of knows the history of and knows where those units are. Uh, so there's also a lot of stigma tied to public housing itself. But more concerningly is the city of Philadelphia has very actively applied rules around incarceration uh, and exposure to incarceration to residents in public housing. There is local discretion about whether you can evict someone based on a course incarceration uh, uh, or a family member being incarcerated uh, uh, and different public housing authorities fall differently on that front. Uh, but Philadelphia's housing authority actually actively uh, evicts folks where there's instances and exposure to, to, to the justice system. Um, yes, question. Uh, really quick. Uh, so, how do you interpret the left graph? It's saying so on the left on the left mm -hmm. graph, where uh, if you're on, if you're subsidized, you should be evicted less because you are helped, right, with your with your rent payment and stuff like that. And, yeah, uh, and so, also yeah. on the on the same level, you also see on the right the public housing eviction rate is actually quite similar to the unsubsidized ones. How do you compare that? Exactly. So this is the great points. Thank you. Um, so uh, so so those are it's it's always helpful when someone also like asks a question that reminds you you should have said something. So thank you for the clarification and the point you made. So the um, so yes. So that so on the left it, it suggests that subsidized housing could protect people from evictions. Right. The filing rate is lower essentially. So the 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 the, the rate per unit is lower than similar market rate properties. Right. Um, so descriptively, that suggests that, you know, there is a positive effect to living in subsidized housing writ large, right, um, uh, regardless of program. But as you pointed out, when you decompose by program, you start seeing that public housing actually has a rate that's more closer to market rate housing uh, than all the other programs, right? And so there clearly is variation by program here as well. Uh, but again, as I said, when I was talking about the public housing program, you know, there's a lot of other things that could be correlating and driving that difference in public housing and particularly where it's cited and some realities going on and on in those neighborhoods where it's not just as simple to look at these line graphs and say, oh, well, clearly public housing is just the same as market rate properties. Descriptively, it actually might seem that way, uh, but, but when you, we find actually when you control for other things, it's actually still a lower eviction filing rate per unit. Um, so yes, did that, did you have a follow up? Yeah, look, maybe real quick. Uh, is that because the unsubsidized ones, uh, a lot of the unsubsidized housing, they might be already well off, so that they're less likely to be evicted, and that might be a contributing factor. Um, so what's interesting is, that is controlled? We, that's controlled for as well. So we don't know okay. who lives in these properties, but we did do is a couple things through census data, and because we have parcel level data, you can essentially estimate a rough approximation for what the composition of households income are at a pretty micro level, right, for that area. So that's not perfect. But what's also interesting is through HUD's picture of subsidized households, you also can know the income levels of subsidized households, uh, sometimes at the track level, sometimes even at the property level, depending on the size of the property. So essentially through those two mechanisms, we can essentially get rough approximations for the incomes of households in uh, in, in the market rate versus the subsidized properties. Sadly, um, Philadelphia, like many other cities, is, is, is a very segregated city by income and race. 
Um, and so what you find often is at the micro level, there actually isn't much income variation within a block group, right? Uh, because of that segregation. Uh, and so what that does is allows you to potentially feel a little more comfortable with some of those assumptions about what that means for the essentially incomes for folks in that development, uh, the market rate versus the, the subsidized development. Does that answer that question? Yes, definitely. Cool. Yeah, so that's exactly one of the things that we're controlling for here as well. And that's a really important point to think of. There could just be differences in income, right? Uh, by virtue of low-income housing serving, uh, you know, low-income households, right? Um, and so our findings across our model is that tenants in subsidized properties on the whole are 60% less likely to receive an eviction filing than those in market rate properties, all else equal. That's with, you know, those controls in place. Tenants in public housing, this is where the controls become important. Uh, when controlling for all, all the other kind of neighborhood related drivers, um, tenants in public housing are actually 65% less likely uh, to receive an eviction filing. Uh, in section eight and section 202 programs, they're 75% less likely. Uh, the associative effects of living in the low-income housing tax credit is actually marginally negative, uh, roughly 5% and statistically insignificant. So there again, we find like a, a, a negative coefficient that's very small and statistically insignificant. So out of all the programs, that's the one that there's the least clear evidence of its protective, uh, uh, protective effects. Uh, all else equal, an increase in the track-wide share of renters who are Black and Latino and renters who pay more than 30% of their income on rent is associated with an increase in the property level eviction rate. Um, larger and newer properties associated with, uh, are associated with higher eviction filing rates. Um, uh, and then a track level increase in the share of housing choice voucher households is actually associated with the higher eviction filing rate. So we couldn't test the Section 8 voucher program, which is a tenant-based subsidy, but we actually could know at least how many voucher households were in any given geography and actually include that in our model and look at the association between the presence of the vouchers uh, and, and, and eviction filing rates. But we're not trying to make any statement here about the protective value of the voucher program uh, because we can't actually uh, attest for that in any meaningful way. For properties and tracks where there's a subsidized, where there is subsidized housing, there's a small, similarly large 55% decrease in the likelihood of receiving eviction filing. The estimated negative effect is largest in tracks with the highest quartile of rent burden. So we looked at some of this nuance of, you know, where is the protective uh, uh, value the most? And interestingly enough, uh, you know, areas where rent burdens are highest, subsidized housing actually tends to have the most protective effects. Public housing associated with a decrease in the actual, uh, actual execution of an eviction by 60%. So here it's not just the filing, it's the actual eviction itself, right? Uh, at section eight and section 202 by 45% all else equal. So that's actually someone actually getting evicted, not just receiving the filing as well. Um, uh, public housing in section eight 202 program is estimated to have a 60 to 70% reduction in default judgments uh, 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 requiring some kind of procedural uh, justice between the owner and the tenant. Um, uh, and essentially these findings are robust uh, amongst many different specifications uh, and particularly around clustering of owners. So one of the, the one of research suggests that there are some serial uh, evictors of owners, right? It's not every property owner. It's actually uh, a small share of owners are actually active serial evictor, evictors. Uh, other owners might be minor evictors and some owners actually rarely, a lot of owners actually rarely, not a lot, some owners rarely evict, right? Uh, and so what we're able to do it through a series of kind of uh, metrics, again, it's hard to know who owns what property, but we came up with estimates for trying to estimate that, to add in these controls, to try to find, you know, who are the larger owners uh, uh, and, and, and could that be driving some of that and we control for that in our model as well. So the results from our model show robust protective effects of residing in public housing and properties receiving project-based rental assistance, not necessarily low-income housing tax credit developments with respects to similar properties. Uh, the potential limitations here is we're not able to identify which units within the low-income housing tax credit properties had affordability restrictions. So what's interesting in a tax credit development, you could actually have some market rate properties units and some affordable units, right? So there's a confounding reality there. We're not able to estimate the effect of housing choice vouchers uh, because that requires individual level data uh, that we do not have access to uh, uh, for this study at least. 
Uh, we're not able to control for individual characteristics uh, within a property, but again, like I said, we control uh, and come up with estimates based on neighborhood level attributes uh, off at the block and at the track level. Um, eviction is still a risk. One thing to, to, to really highlight here though is we're, we're finding clear protective effects uh, of, of, of eviction for subsidized households or place-based subsidized households, but it's not zero, right? As we saw in that line graph, there are households in public housing who are still getting evicted, right? So they still could be more protected than a similar market rate unit, but it doesn't mean that the threat of eviction is zero, right? And so it means that we shouldn't go in uh, and, and, and pretend this is a panacea, right, in any way. We can see this as a, a, an effective intervention and investment that reduces the odds of eviction, but we can't view this as the thing that wholeheartedly protects households from eviction. And we need to kind of need, naturally dive into the nuance of that and look at the broad set of tools that kind of address the, the various reasons why someone's evicted uh, and, 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 and which of these mechanisms in place within subsidized housing programs even are protecting folks, which ones might not be, uh, and, and how to create uh, additional protections that, uh, that, that, that serve our most small residents. So here's my email address. That's my Twitter handle. I'm actually horrendous at Twitter. Twitter. I'm on it. Uh, I don't really do much on it, but I, you know, I, I'd love to engage with you there as well, I guess, uh, uh, or minimally on my end, but I, I'll probably just watch what you do. Um, uh, so uh, thank you for having me here today and I welcome any, any questions or comments. Thank you very much, Victor, for an uh, incredibly rich uh, presentation on, on, a range, on the range of issues and the data and uh, what you were looking at. Uh, we have a half an hour for questions or so, so I'm going to go to them quickly. People can raise their hand. Um, I'm going to just make two quick observations. One, you reinforce the degree to which being poor in America is still viewed as a crime in and of itself. And secondly, the, the sort of incredible, long lasting, lingering ill effects of the of Jeremy Bentham's panopticon and the view that observation will make people be better. In fact, what we find is that observation makes them more prey to being arrested. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, with that, I like to recognize Suzanne. And, and I would just say, can I just say before that, thank you for saying that. I mean, I'm I'm appalled with how pervasive this stuff is. So the Senate Banking Committee just had a, a, a panel on fair and equitable housing, right? And because it has to be bipartisan, they get you know five speakers, two of which were from the American Enterprise Institute citing, I mean, the most horrendous studies that have been debunked, uh, uh, that are rooted in racism, that blame poor people, that don't look at broader context. And it's just amazing how pervasive it is uh, to this day, even in our current setting where we're really reckoning with a lot of these realities that in a presentation to the Senate Banking Committee, 40% of them could very much perpetuate the same essentially falsehoods and 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 uh, that 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 you know it, it's just hard to to counter when someone's comfortable you know with non-facts, right? Um, and and then doing it at the cost of of low-income people who are just struggling to get by, right? So sorry, I, I I can go on my soapbox. I'll stop. Sorry, Suzanne. I think you were. <laughs> Oh, no, no problem. Um, this is really super important work and really excited to see um, yours and, and other papers in that uh, special is issue of the uh, H housing policy debate uh, eviction issue. Really, really great work. Um, at referring back to your discussion about how the misperception of public housing tenants, um, behavioral, behavioral regulation and discrimination increase the chances of eviction. Did you find that public housing residents living within HOPE 6 mixed income, income developments have a higher rate of eviction than residents in public housing operated by PHAs? So you, you mentioned that the restriction on your data doesn't allow you to identify um, uh, subsidized units within say LIHTC developments. But I guess what I'm asking is, did you see an association between the presence of market rate tenants mm -hmm. in a development with eviction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's a that's a really great question, and 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 the beauty of these talks is they always point to different ways you can cut the data. So one thing, uh, public housing authority in Philadelphia do, has done is is massive redevelopments of its public housing sites, 
um, uh, the, the traditional Hope Six style, uh, you know, demolition of towers, reconstruction of, of lower density units. Um, what's interesting is a lot of the Hope Six developments traditionally have, have all remained public housing units and affordable. Um, so there wasn't a market rate infusion in the same way. Uh, I wouldn't say it's by virtue. I would say it's probably because, you know, it, the city of Philadelphia was still declining actively during all those time. And what was market rate was, you know, it, 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 there, was, there was very few market rate units and, and appetite for them in general, right? In the city, uh, no, no less than a redeveloped public housing site. And so, uh, so uh, what you do see though now is through the RAD conversion program, as you're suggesting too, some can convert some units to the tax credit, you know, uh, portfolio. And there's actually redevelopment right now that's doing that where a portion are gonna be tax credit units. Um, uh, and so we don't control for that at all, but it would be really interesting to kind of see because in some ways the social controls might be less in those Hope 6 redevelopments. Um, you know, there's one five blocks for me actually that they're, I mean, they're, they're aesthetically beautiful and they actually blend into the landscape. So particularly for newer residents and gentrifiers, they might not even know that that's public housing or subsidized housing. So some of those social controls get applied a little less. So that would actually be a really interesting way of, uh, we can add that extra control within public housing to look at that nuance. Uh, so, so thank you for that. We didn't do that. You know, could also cut the other way that market rate tenants within a Hope Six development, and I'm 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 thinking of Chicago, so it was done a little differently in Chicago, but but um, that they may be more likely to call the police or to report, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, other behaviors that they see is not um, aligning with expectations. But yeah, really. yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that was uh, yeah. I mean, it's uh, and I, I, you know, personally, I, I've seen that you know, play out for, so So again, in, in Philadelphia, I think, I don't think, so the market rate un, unit would be a neighbor, right? Because I think they, a lot of the, all those units remain public. So they just de-densify, but they didn't actually do mix of incomes as much. Uh, I think actually pretty rarely, and I could check that for sure, but that's actually a good nuance finding. But, you know, I, I there's, there's a nice little park that's actually uh, the next neighbor over by a public housing redevelopment uh, where where half of it is actually public housing redevelopment and half of it's market rate. And I happened to be there with my kids. Uh, you know, they were just playing on the grass uh, and a neighbor from a market rate unit came out. Um, and I don't think he was talking to some, he knew he'd be talking to someone who studies subsidized housing because, uh, uh, you know, the social controls he was spewing from his mouth were ones that uh, that uh, I used very kind words because my kids were around and, and tried to use it as a moment to educate and convince. Uh, uh, but it was amazing how his priors were so strong, uh, and and it was just it was just so interesting to see that play out. Like, and he you know he walked up to me as another white man and said you know, so and it was just it was just so appalling and concerning, but shows the real reality that half those half that park those residents face every day, right? Um, which is which is quite concerning. We should move to Yuna with her question. Hi, Dr. Reyna. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's really good to see you on Zoom. Um, so I was I was wondering if you could speak more about the specific owners who tend to evict these um, renters more. I was wondering if there could be some differences on those owners or developers who specializes on affordable housing, would they be more kind of flexible to these um, challenges that comes up? Um, was that, a, did, did, you have, did you have any data on that? I mean, that's a wonderful question and that's a really hard one to know. Uh, so we don't, we didn't test for that, but that's an important reality, which is again, not all owners are the same. Uh, you know, there are some nonprofits that own developments that are market rate or affordable or mix. Uh, and there's some for-profits, but even within the nonprofit, that can mean very different things, right? Uh, and so you have technically nonprofit entities, which are shell entities, single asset corporations set up, but turns out their main owners are for-profit. Uh, you have true community development corporations that are true nonprofits, right? Even within the community development corporation space, you have some that are actively uh, uh, developing properties and asset managing and others that are facing harder times, right? Uh, in my in my role at LISC, one of the one of my portfolios is actually often dealing with repositioning uh, uh, affordable housing developments owned by CDCs, uh, where their capacity had dwindled and their properties had dwindled, 
and they were facing the risk of essentially exiting subsidized housing uh, by virtue of failing housing quality standards. And so the CDC wanted them to remain affordable, uh, but, but needed capacity support and financing to actually do that. So all to say that there's tons of nuance there. And unfortunately, we're not able to, to unpack that a lot because of data limitation. And I think that's where uh, I'm hopeful that, you know, with the increase of, of, of information and of the use of data science to really kind of link data sets together in new and interesting ways, but also with the real acknowledgement that there's wonderful qualitative work that can and should explore this, and some of which I'm sure likely does already, uh, there's, there's a lot more we can learn there about unpacking the owner piece. So I, that's, uh, I would, I would love to love to see that. Unfortunately, I think it's out of the scope of what our data will allow here, but, but that's clearly, a, uh, an important reality to unpack. So here's another question that doesn't have to, which is probably outside your data reality, but you know, my, my image of city ownership of a property is, is that there's a lot of resources to bear and a bureaucracy that sort of protects action and also and rules um, and private home private property owners have less of an infrastructure to protect them from from maybe a unfavorable court ruling or some other response so actually what i'm wondering is whether the presence or the power of anti-eviction or other advocacy groups working on behalf of renters or these people actually has a marked difference in outcomes, either individually or in a community? That's a, that's a good question. Um, so, I mean, sadly, that space, as you know well, is under-resourced, right? So even with kind of active advocacy, uh, we, I mean, Philadelphia's Community Legal Services is um, is just amazing. Rashida Phillips there, I mean, she like walks on water in my eyes. If you don't know her, you should Google her. She's, uh, her, her leadership in this space is just, is just phenomenal. Um, uh, the, you know, the, there is uh, a lack of, still a lack of resources around legal protection for eviction, but even kind of uh, knowledge about process of eviction, right? Which is why, when I said before, the city of Philadelphia is really unique that they just require, they're requiring owners to go through their rent relief program to actually file an eviction now is pretty phenomenal because what they find clearly is that even with something like an eviction moratorium in place, uh, advocacy organizations locally, um, there still are uh, a lot of gaps in knowledge, a lot of gaps in trust uh, that are rooted in, in real, you know, real lived experiences. Uh, and, and limited resources around eviction protection. That said, public housing actually has like a whole separate court essentially here in Philadelphia, and that's not uncommon for other cities, right? Uh, so what that could do, or what that actually does do, I think is it actually exposes them a little more uh, to, uh, to kind of uh, the existing uh, anti-eviction groups who can who can acknowledge what's going on when at what scale, right? And can really know it's tied to that one owner and target that one owner. Um, you know, there's a lot of, as I said before, and sorry, I, I, I'll, I'll keep rambling, so please stop me because I might not actually be answering your question. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of challenges around who owns these properties, right? Uh, even things like requiring owners to register their properties uh, when they're filing an eviction, Philadelphia recently did. It's a very controversial thing. You would think that's basic, right? Like you should have to file, you should have to be a known owner in the city in order to be able to go through our courts and legally evict someone, right? Um, the fact that for so long that wasn't even the case shows like uh, not just the challenges of capacity on the city end to, 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 um, uh, to pursue some of that, but also often a lack of concern about what the private sector will, how the private sector will react, right? Philadelphia and many other cities have still this mindset that they have to leverage the private sector as much as possible, which is, could be true, but it often comes at the cost of doing things simple like that. You know, people say, oh, well, no one will invest in Philadelphia if you make it harder to evict people because then they're not going to want to develop properties. So, you know, those kinds of narratives are really hard to get around um, that kind of permeate throughout the process. So I, I'm not sure I actually answered your question there. I just said a whole bunch of different things that hopefully were related. <laughs> All useful. John, you have a question? Sure. Uh, 
Vince, uh, you, you make me wish that all our, US, all our URS graduates are gonna do such wonderful work, but uh, don't, don't let up, man. Um, the, the question you, you mentioned right at the, at the very beginning that you'd been involved in uh, developing a housing plan for Philadelphia and you mentioned, I think, a new agency. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can give us a sense of whether the public support or coalitions are changing to support, you know, related housing work. And then, of course, I'm curious about your crystal ball about the implications of the new administration and the politics we see there for housing support. Yeah, that's a that's a great so, question. So, so one on one one hand, local Philadelphia urban politics and development, and on the other, what you see on the horizon. So I actually so I see Greg Preston is here, my co-author. Um, okay. Hi, Greg. You've probably been here all along, and and then uh, he probably uh, I would say uh, you know it's Greg is on. like his data skills, uh, his broad knowledge on this stuff is absolutely tremendous. And so Greg, do you actually wanna answer the local question and maybe I'll answer the national question? Are you okay with that? Because I know you were actively involved in the eviction task force. Um, uh, that's actually how we met. He recruited me to facilitate the private owner working group, focus group uh, for the eviction diversion task force that he was helping write their report. Uh, so do you wanna to speak to that a little bit, Greg? Yeah, could you repeat just the first part of the question? I had to double task with class, so I was kind of like listening in. And yeah, as a doctoral student, wanted to be here, but. I, I was just wondering how, how in Philadelphia in the last five, 10 years, there, there's been developing support coalitions to support uh, better housing policy across the board, what that looked like. And, and I was wondering then, what the national, you know, what the national horizon might be with this, with the change in administrations. Yeah, um, you know, I had the I had the privilege of working uh, for the city and kind of organizing a bunch of different, um, like local. Uh, there were representatives from the legal community. There were representatives from like city municipal government. There were representatives from landlord associations, and I think you know, to the extent that that was like a good space, it was a year long kind of task force meeting. Um, and we set a, a variety of like agenda uh, and research goals and whatnot. Um, and like kind of like policy things to go through. I think to some extent it was also sort of symbolic of things that had already been going on. Um, I think that there was a lot of work that led up to and has happened in the aftermath of this task force that uh, I think the task force just helped to symbolize or bring maybe some some reality to that, but I do see Philadelphia as kind of a uh, a local exception to a lot of the ways that other local municipalities work with regard to eviction. Um, I think it really has been kind of like a confluence of people who are really dedicated and have put a lot of work into this, as well as just kind of some local politics that have um, fallen into place. Philadelphia has passed probably five to six um, like really momentous uh, renter protections and other policy things that have really gotten the ball rolling on this. Hmm. Yeah, and they, they've definitely done a lot of, uh, so the eviction task force suggestions became a part of the housing plan, right? They were, they were work, they became essentially a working group and a lot of their recommendations got formalized in the plan itself. Uh, and, and a lot of that has actually moved forward through increased regulations. They have an amazing local eviction diversion program that's proven to be very successful. Uh, and they've become increasingly comfortable with you know, regulating evictions and just forcing certain rules of the game, still not as far along as, as they can be, but in, in the greater scheme of the national setting, I think more at the forefront. I would say one of the things that's really interesting is that you know, COVID-19 has really, um, uh, really exacerbated, as we know, a lot of the existing realities going on in markets across the country. But I think as a result, it's forced localities and the federal government to really reckon with a lot of the structural issues with housing policy. Um, so what you saw in Philadelphia in their rent relief program, a third of owners did not participate in the program. That meant a tenant applied, they reached out to the owner, the owner said, I don't want your subsidy, right? And so what that effectively meant is this tenant could not get rent relief that would protect them from being evicted, that would affect their debt levels because the owner said no. The city said that's appalling. So what they actually did is they converted the rest of the money to a cash transfer. Um, so they said, fine, owner, you say no, we're just giving the money directly to the tenant. 
They may pay the rent, they may do other things. We're not regulating at that point, but we need to move away from this model where we believe the landlord's the arbiter of who receives benefits and who's not. Um, that was something that the city had been toying with. We actually, the mayor had announced a universal basic income experiment uh, that I helped them design and we were gonna evaluate the week before the COVID shutdown. Um, uh, and, uh, and the city was gonna fully fund it from their pilot. The acknowledgement was that there are many marginalized households who can't access these systems and programs. Uh, they're well documented. We know even the voucher program, black households, households with kids and elderly households are least likely to be able to use the voucher even making it through all that process of being offered the voucher, right? And so, um, so the universal basic income was the acknowledgement that you know sometimes cash is better, right? And we need to give tenants a, the ability to decide their own futures, right? Uh, and, and to have agency in that process and not just rely on landlord consent for that. Uh, what you saw is that um, one, we're seeing UBI being discussed more broadly nationally, right? I think COVID has actually contributed to that. But in the rent relief space, actually, what you saw is a lot of places then start experimenting with these cash transfers. Uh, I've been working with the city of LA in their first round, 45% of owners did not participate in their rent relief program. Uh, they converted all those to cash transfers and we helped them figure out the mechanisms for doing that. They actually worked with Philly. These are moments of real local innovation that was acknowledged at the national level to the point that the subsequent round of $25 billion of rent relief that was released due to those examples. And I'd like to think actually due to some of our research where across the programs, we actually presented it to Treasury, the White House and HUD showing issues of landlord non-participation. They actually created a clause in the funding that if an owner doesn't respond within seven days of being offered the rental assistance, they can actually directly convert it to a cash transfer, right? Um, still maybe not as far along as allowing programs from the get-go to be cash transfer programs, but still a major monumental improvement in our acknowledgement of the role of tenants in this process. Uh, I would say, you know, aside through fair housing laws, which are kind of passive ways of addressing eviction, but clearly correlated in many ways, uh, some of those recent announcements, uh, I know that there's a lot of things on the table with the Biden administration uh, that are, are really at the forefront of, of viewing eviction as, an, as a, national, uh, a national issue, right? But knowing also that they play out differently at the local level. So that is the challenge of national policy, right? There's a lot of local nuance, there's a lot of local context. Uh, that I think um, uh, uh, is really um, uh, important to acknowledge that the federal government does have a distinct role, particularly in providing resources, providing a base point, but there is really is a need for local will, right? And local protections that, that, that look beyond and acknowledge that local variation. And I think Philadelphia has really done a lot. And again, that kind of, uh, I keep referring to their requirement of, of uh, transacting in rental relief programs to file an eviction going forward that's really an example of a locality saying, look, we're gonna go a step further with this program and put this other requirement on it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, you had, a, when you were talking about different structures, particularly market rate, you said you didn't have a lot of data and I appreciate that I was, I'm putting words in your mouth there sort of, but um, in, in thinking about programs, particularly say in New York, and I'm sure this exists everywhere where, you know, New York had the controversial poor door on some buildings because more and more buildings require a certain percentage of the, to accommodate um, low income tenants. There are two issues, one is, the rule that they have to include them. And the second is where the funding for that will come from. And, and so um, I know you didn't have, you know, we can't necessarily speculate about where it's going to come from, but in terms of, of that kind of regulation, Suzanne had mentioned that she thought there might be a tendency for the people to police more in a mixed income situation. The second part, but, but the other part of the question is in many cases, what's being required is low income, but there are different levels, right? There's low income, there's very low income. So I'm not sure that, that these buildings are required to house everyone. 
And even some of the low income buildings that are being made are significant percentages of the local area income. Can you talk a little bit about maybe how the different levels of income um, and selection process that's happening are either solidifying in another set of hurdles or maybe changing the conversation a little bit? Yeah, so I mean, it's interesting. So in the context of Philadelphia as a city, right? And again, I'm gonna keep coming to Philadelphia because that's where we're focused, but there's clearly also kind of national and other city ways of thinking of this. The city of Philadelphia has a 26% poverty rate, right? And so what you find is there is a severe concentration of very poor households. Um, uh, and, and there's little variation in the income mix beyond that. And sadly, because of historic disinvestment, racism and segregation, they're, they're very spatially concentrated on the whole, right? Uh, and, and so there's a couple of neighborhoods in Philadelphia that are gentrifying. And so they have uh, temporary mixed incomes, right? Uh, uh, it's a, a, probably not gonna be a steady state of mixed incomes, but for the few subsidized properties actually in those developments. That said, um, to Suzanne's point and some of what you're saying here as well, is that the city of Philadelphia by virtue of being uh, historically one of the largest cities in the US, uh, Unfortunately, seems to have frozen. Per resident in Philadelphia, you know, the top 10 cities in the US essentially have like 90% of the public housing, right? New York has by far the most, uh, but, then, but then beyond that, you know, Philadelphia, I think might be third or so. I, I forget exactly where they are in public unit counts, but they have more public housing than per person than actually other cities. Uh, and that public housing actually often tends to be in the center of the city, right? Because these programs were also developing where there was severe disinvestment in the city itself. Uh, and so there is the challenge there of uh, in the few neighborhoods that are mixed income by virtue of being gentrifying right now, uh, a lot of them are increasingly ones where there is subsidized housing protecting some pool of low-income households and allowing them to actually remain in that neighborhood, which, like you're saying, could have increased kind of some of these uh, some of these social control realities for for those households. And those were some of the things that we were trying to kind of like unpack in our research of look at in neighborhoods where maybe you're the subsidized housing development amidst all market rate developments, so you're the one subsidized housing development, or you're the one affordable housing development amidst uh, overall a neighborhood that's gentrified or prices have gone up. How do these dynamics play out a little more? And I, Greg, I know you can speak a little more to those, those data and reality, um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's definitely a clear kind of challenge of, 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 of kind of exploring, not just the dynamics, but also the implications, because also, Wait, sorry, before I turn it over to you, Greg, one more thing that in the low-income housing tax credit program, like you said, a low-income housing tax credit development in Philadelphia, the rents are essentially set at area median income, uh, which for Philadelphia and very rich suburbs means that it's not affordable for someone below the poverty line, right? So someone in Philadelphia who lives in a tax credit development where, where there's no other forms of subsidy on it, which is often the case in Philadelphia, they are very likely to be housing cost burden, right? So they're in affordable housing, but they're housing cost burden still, right? And so that program, you know, structurally plays out differently in Philadelphia than it might in New York, where still that person could be housing cost burden, but it actually might still be relatively lower cost to market rate developments. Uh, so in Philadelphia, you might actually find that someone's in a tax credit development. They're not necessarily paying a lower rent, but they might be getting like, uh, a newer unit, right? Um, so there may be slightly less housing cost burden, uh, but their unit is newer and maybe even in a location that they wouldn't have been able to afford uh, uh, in, in the city. So sorry, Greg, uh, do you wanna add to some of our nuance of, of looking at some of those neighborhood stuff? Yeah, uh, so there have been, I mean, the definition of like what it means for a neighborhood to gentrify is obviously very contentious. And so um, in kind of like trying to at least descriptively or exploratorily look at some of these um, dynamics of eviction and changing neighborhoods. Uh, I found a couple papers that were, that were uh, Philadelphia specific and applied the uh, kind of like categories or the um, identification of tracks that they saw as changing between 2000 and um, I think 2015 were most of the endpoints of the papers. And so uh, ran like a subset of analysis of like the, um, 
the eviction filing and eviction rates within those neighborhoods. And um, we didn't find uh, the, the model as we constructed it, uh, there were no significant effect of like, uh, you know, the change in percent of white population, the change in um, kind of the like median property value uh, that, might, that we might associate with neighborhood change. But that's not to say that neighborhood change is not part of the, is not part of the story. Um, I think it can show up in a variety of ways. And I think exactly like um, Vincent noted that the, the kind of like pockets of neighborhood change in Philadelphia are quite small. And um, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to parse out uh, some of these dynamics on this like individual basis. So it's a, it's a thing. And I think I saw um, there's a couple new papers that were just released uh, on housing policy debate that try to tackle uh, this question of gentrification and eviction. Um, I think one is in Wisconsin and one is in Atlanta. And the, the gentrification paper he's talking about is uh, Jackie Wang, who's now in the sociology department at Stanford, um, did some work with the Federal Reserve Bank in Philadelphia and they came up with some interesting measures and Pew had another one as well. Thank you. So technically we have come to the um, end of our time in colloquium and um, some really great uh, questions. But again, um, really terrific presentation and a great way to end our um, colloquium for this semester. So thanks um, to Vincent and um, and for all the people who are taking um, this series for credit, you'll get information on your uh, essays. We look forward to seeing them and otherwise have a terrific and um, lowered stress end of the semester for everyone. Yes, John. And congrats on tenure. And congrats on tenure. Thank you. I, I, I just want to say thank you again for having me. It, it really is. I, I only wish I could be there in person, but I, uh, I was uh, a first generation college student who realized engineering wasn't for me at Cornell and was trying to find my place. And the urban studies department very much helped me find that place. They put me on the road that I am right now, and they remain tremendously supportive to this day. So if I could be that person for any of you, please let me know, because it's a really special place, uh, and, I, and I'm forever grateful. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.